Okay, the ceremonial button pressing has commenced. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome to you, whoever you are, old or new friends. Appreciate you listening. How's it going? How are things in your world? If I'm not mistaken... It was this time last week that I was talking about how wonderful the weather was here in Pennsylvania and how alive everything felt. The plants were bursting and I wanted to bring that aliveness with me. Well, I am struck by how often life is full of cruel irony and this week It's like the opposite is true. (laughs) It's gray and it's gloomy outside and my mood is matching. And normally, if I was in a kind of crabby mood, I wouldn't try to record intros and outros for the podcast. I would wait, give it some more time. Maybe I could find another, you know, wave. Like I was just hearing someone talk earlier this week about emotions being like weather systems, you know? And I would sometimes just wait to see if the storm would pass a little bit and I could catch a better vibe to hit record and get the podcast out this week. But you know what? I don't have time because my wife's got a gig. She's got a freelance gig and we need the money. So she's leaving for two days. I got solo dad duty. I can't just like put this off till later today. It's like it has to happen now. So this is what we got. You know, we're bringing what we got. We are where we are. I can't be the only one who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed. In some ways, it's kind of like a sign for me that, at least in my household and in my situation, I do feel like the whole pandemic stuff's a little bit in the rear view. It's not like it's not still lingering and there's like a whole bunch of stuff still happening, but it's that before the world fell apart, I was dealing with just like the weight of, you know, the material world and making the ends meet with a young family, you know, just if you recall, if you were listening to the show back then, I talked about this, I'm sure plenty of times, it was just sort of like the weight of everything was a lot and I was often feeling overwhelmed by that. And then the last few years, it's almost been like just triage, you know? You just didn't have time to feel that weight. And then just there was like a momentum that took over. And it felt like I just got swept up in that momentum and have just been riding that wave. It's like, you know, roaring rapids. And you're just like on the seat of your pants with the oar trying to like not hit any rocks, you know? And so now it's like we've, We've passed the rapid, rocky terrain, and now we're like kind of sailing along in a more calmer fashion. But there's like a a waterfall ahead, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I'm straining the metaphor, but maybe you get the idea. I'm feeling a little bit like I don't have the resources to meet the demands But it's probably just a mood. It'll pass. And I'm fine. Everything's okay, you know. I'm going to get through it. I suppose that is really why I keep coming back to this conversation about God and higher power here on the show. If you're new around here, I've been having these conversations about spirit and soul and God and higher power. I think it's because... For many years in my yoga practice and teaching, it is all about self-empowerment. It's about being empowered to know for yourself, to discern for yourself, to be able to take charge of your health and your well-being and your direction and make strong choices and shape life in ways that you'd want it to be. And I feel like that's true to some degree. Like I can make choices. I can shape my life in different ways. But at some point, 
<laughs> There's so much of what's happening that's beyond me. I can't do it. I need help. I need help. And some of that help comes from friends and family and comes from my intentioned efforts. But I think also some of that help comes from something bigger than me. And I'm more and more becoming comfortable with recognizing that and acknowledging it and maybe even sharing that idea or that recognition with others. And as you know, I had some conversations recently about this and it was had a lot about like, you know, material viewpoints as opposed to like spiritual viewpoints or, or maybe not oppo- as opposed to <laughs> maybe and also. And today's conversation for me is a important and significant continuation to this inquiry that I've been undertaking with you all. My guest is Hari Kirtandas. And Hari has been on the show before, but it has been a long time. The early days of the show, 2016, we had a conversation about non-duality, which we again today have a conversation about non-duality, but in a whole different way, in a much more nuanced way. It's very interesting for me. I encourage anybody listening to go back and listen to the archive episode with Hari from 2016 and then compare it to today's. It's it's really something. In any case, Hari is incredibly knowledgeable and I didn't realize we were going to have the conversation that we did before we had it. Like it was one of those situations where I had an idea about what I would talk to him about, specifically about Bhagavad Gita, because I saw he was doing this workshop and I was covering it with people in my training. I thought it'd be good to have a conversation about it, but in getting ready to talk to him, there's all this stuff on his website that I didn't know was there. And it led to like the deepest questions I've been asking. And I really learned something from this conversation. I've had to listen back to it a couple of times. So for any of you who've been following along or not, it's just a real serious depth of inquiry into what yoga spiritual texts and philosophical viewpoints have to say about individual souls and a supreme being. So I, I really am grateful for this show and the way that it brings conversations like this into my life. And I'm very overjoyed to be able to share it with all of you today. Real quick, before we get to it, if you're enjoying the show and you want to find other ways to connect with me or other people who are also interested in these kinds of conversations, you can check out all the stuff I have on offer at jbrownyoga.com. There's a full range of possibilities depending on what your situation is and what you're looking for from a $5 a month subscription to the podcast premium where you get full access to the archives and help support this show to registering for my year-long teacher training, which you can do right now and you can start any time for half price until August, by the way. And there's also stuff in between there. So, Whatever it is that you might be interested in, whether it's practice or group discussions or deeper inquiries, I've got some stuff on offer. And if you want to find out more about any of it, go to jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's good. We've got quite a lot to get to. I will touch base with you on the other side for a moment, but let's go ahead and get to it. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Hari Kirtana Das. Hello. Hey, Jay. Hey, Hari. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. It has been a minute, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. I don't even know if we last time we didn't, use, we didn't have the, I think we might have been using Skype. It's that long ago since we talked. <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> wow. Well, it's good to see you. I am already recording. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to consider us having just begun. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine with me. Very cool. You were here on the show one other time in May of 2016, which is a long time ago. Certainly in internet years, yeah. We talked about uh, non-duality some. You told us about your time in the Hare Krishna movie. You told us the history of all of that. Mm Mm-hmm. And... At that time, I definitely associated you with someone I would consider to be more religious or at least devotional Mm -hmm. in the yoga that they held. And I thought of myself as very like spiritual, but not religious. Right. However, a lot's happened since then. And as I mentioned to you in my email, I sent you some links. I originally reached out to you because you were doing a workshop on stoicism and the Bhagavad Gita, which I'm interested in. I think we might still get to that today. Okay. But in getting ready to talk to you, I went to your website. I read this piece about spirit soul, the phrase spirit soul that you wrote. Mm -hmm. And that really went to like a lot of my most burning question these days. So I kind of want to start there with you. Okay. And Even just like on your website, on one of the pages, you have a series of bullet points that I want to read for everybody listening because it goes right to the questions that I have. Okay. You wrote, um, first you said the science of self-realization is the art of learning how to dance with God. You're not afraid to use the word God. Mm -hmm. And then you had these bullet points by reimagining our conception of God by reimagining our definition of religion, by redefining what it means to be a person, by thinking of the universe as a universal person, by thinking of awareness as an integral part of infinite awareness. And then this is the one that really stood out to me. You wrote, by considering that the supreme being can be both imminent and transcendent, and there's one more you talk about by realizing that a relationship with God doesn't have to come with all the baggage. And so for me, I just had a conversation last week in like a teacher sangha. And there was this moment where we're talking about everything being interconnected and we're talking about energy and it feels like we're spiritual, but not religious. But there's a moment when you try to, consider the idea of like a higher power or God, or you wrote supreme being, keyword being, Mm -hmm. that it starts to automatically feel like a religious thought. It's like, even though I don't identify with a particular organized religion, once I talk about higher power, it stops feeling spiritual, but not religious for a lot of people, it seems like especially if you talk about getting guidance, receiving guidance or anything like that, you're moving into like this faith place or something else that seems to make some, a lot of people uncomfortable because there's a lot of baggage as you point to. Right. So I guess to start, I'm wondering when you talk about reimagining a conception of God and a, a definition of religion, what is the conception of God and religion that you're talking about and can it be distinguished from organized religion, I guess? Or what would you say about it? I would say yes, that it certainly can be distinguished from organized religion or religion as we commonly think about it, or certainly the institutions that arise due to the necessity of having to organize religion. Uh, that's something that keeps happening out of uh, necessity uh, and then unfortunately is subject to corruption of all kinds because human beings, what can you do? So we begin with this idea of God and I'm not afraid to use that term. However, I am very quick to redefine that term because when I speak to people who say uh, they are atheists and they don't believe in God, my first question is, what kind of God are you talking about? Please describe to me the God you do not believe in. And then they describe their conception of God to me. And my response 100% of the time is, 
I don't believe in that God either. And usually, at least it, now, people who are spiritual but not religious, they doubt. They don't so much usually say, uh, I don't believe. Most of the time what I hear is, I doubt that a God who is like X could possibly be God, because it just doesn't seem consistent with the idea of what God's character would be like. And I say, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's not consistent with what God's character would be like. And that, of course, leads into a discussion of, A, what is God's character like? And if God has a character, what does that say about the attribute of personness in absolute reality? With atheists, uh, usually they rail not so much against God, but against religion against the institutions, against organized religion and what human beings have done to the whole idea of religion. Yeah, the crazy stories that people who are religious believe in, like fantastical Mm -hmm. stories that couldn't possibly be true. We're smarter than that now. Well, that's a whole, that, that gets into a whole other issue of where, where are we getting our information about God and uh, what is our conception of epistemology, how we separate something that is true from an opinion or an overlay or, you know, something like that. So when I start to work with someone who wants to discuss this with me, uh, most of this involves asking questions about what is your highest possible conception of God. If you were going to build a supreme being, then what would the ingredients be? What would that being Uh, look like, feel like, sound like, what would they do? What would their characteristics or attributes be? And this is kind of uh, an exercise coming out of Anselm's ontological truth, uh, proof for the existence of God. God is that being that is greater than any other being you can conceive of. And it's a really interesting exercise to come up with a conception of a supreme being that inspires faith, not just from the standpoint of one's heart or one's belief, but one that actually is rational, that makes sense, that explains existence itself in terms of one categorically different kind of being who is the source of all being, being itself and beyond being. And therefore, as I think Karen Armstrong correctly asserts, is not a being. It's not like there's one of us who's just better <laughs> at everything. That's why I said keyword being, because when you say the word being, it makes it seem like this intelligence or this force. It gets personified in a certain way or something. But You're saying that it's a being, but not a being. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is a categorically different kind of being who is both inconceivable and knowable. The knowable part comes from revelation. In other words, if there is a categorically different kind of being who has all the attributes that you would think of a supreme being having, then one of those very, very important attributes is independence and free will. So here's how I like to think about this. Or yet yet another question that I ask in, in this kind of investigation. Who do we reveal ourselves to? I mean, really reveal ourselves to. Who do we show our true selves to? We show ourselves to the people we trust. We don't reveal ourselves to just anybody. There's some qualification. And the first qualification is, if I'm going to reveal myself to you, I have to trust you. And who do we trust? We trust the people who love us. The more the more love that we experience, the greater the trust, and therefore the greater the revelation. 
hence devotional yoga, the cultivation or the practice of love for the supreme person. And now I'm going to change gears by saying the supreme person instead of the supreme being, because if the supreme being is complete, then the attribute of personness must also be there, which explains, as far as I'm concerned, how it is that we have the attribute of being a person. We are a part of the complete reality. And just as in fractal geometry, you know, the little tiny parts have the same attributes as the whole. If we're a person, if we're each a person, then the whole of which we are a part must have the attribute of being a person. Logically, you cannot give what you do not have. Therefore, in bhakti yoga, the cultivation of a relationship between the infinitesimal part person and the infinite whole person is the objective. And by the cultivation of love as a verb, as an action, you do things that are acts of love. Even if you're not feeling it right away, well, that's why it's a practice. There, in bhakti yoga, there are two kinds of bhakti. Sadhana bhakti, your, uh, the practice of loving actions, and Raganuga Bhakti, love that is spontaneous. And the actions stay the same. But the motivation changes from I'm cultivating love to I am expressing a love that has developed. And to the extent that we are able to cultivate genuine feelings of love for this supreme person, to that extent, it is in the character of the supreme person to want to reveal him, her, it, they, selves. Because just as we find our greatest happiness in relationships of love, once again, so the supreme person also experiences the greatest happiness in relationships of love. I think it's very interesting. I guess this is what you meant when you talked about a universal person, like the universe as a universal person is this idea. If I have some kind of personness, then the source from which I come also would have some aspect of personness to it because I come from that, right? Yeah, there's a qualitative unity. Mm -hmm. Quantitatively, we are not in possession of universal consciousness. I know what's going on with me. You know what's going on with you. Everyone knows what's going on with themselves. But there's one person who knows what's going on with everybody. Everywhere, See, but that's the contention the point. Not everybody's willing to concede that there's one person who knows what's going on with everyone at all times. I guess that's the sticking point. What's the basis for asserting that is true? other than just how you feel about it or your own faith? The first basis for it is scriptural. The Bhagavad Gita speaks very specifically about the field, the body, the knower of the field, each individual person who knows what's going on in their body, and the knower in all fields, the universal consciousness who is present within the hearts of all beings, which Krishna speaks about in the 15th chapter and then emphasizes again in the 18th chapter as he's summarizing uh, everything. This idea that there is the Atma and then the Paramatma, the paramount Atma, the one soul of all souls who uh, is present with us uh, at all times. And the Upanishads give the example of two birds in a tree, one bird is uh, eating the fruits on the branch of the tree, and some of the fruits are bitter and some are sweet. And the other bird is not engaged in this activity of looking for uh, happiness in the fruits of the tree, but is really just waiting for their friend to remember that they are there. And wherever the first bird looking for the tasty fruit flies, the second bird goes with them. So there's a basis for this in yoga wisdom texts, in the Upanishads, in the Bhagavad Gita, um, 
And depending on who you speak to, Ishvara in the Yoga Sutras is the Paramatma, is this supreme consciousness, the meditate, the, the turning of the senses inward, Pratyahara, uh, and then the sequence of uh, Samyama, concentration, meditation, and ultimately complete absorption in the object of meditation. Uh, well, what is the object of meditation that Patanjali recommends? Ishvara. Well, if you're turning your senses inward, Ishvara must be in there. I mean, it's very interesting that you bring that up. I'm doing this teacher training right now with folks, and we're right at the point where we're talking about Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And I just like rewatched this video I made that they're all watching that will be the basis of our discussions. And I realized I got to that point in the in the, the Niyamas where it talked about Ishvana Pradhanana, it says devotion to God. And I just think I've sort of conveniently, I don't know, skipped over that. Or what I did was, you see, I had a conception of God that thought of it as, I see when you say a, like a universal person or something, when you use the word universal, it can become like a more impersonal force, like a force of nature, like I conceived of God in a way that allowed me to be devoted to it in the way that I might be devoted to nature or, or the, the forces of the universe. And a lot of people are totally on board with that. People go outside, they experience trees and nature and they can feel a sense of like something sacred and something divine about that very easily. But I've also been talking about, you might, you listen to the conversations where I've had these moments in times of late where I felt like there was more of a personal God, a personal relationship happening. And that's where it like, I don't know, it seems to always get a little bit sticky. I don't know how, is that what you mean when you say imminent and transcendent? Yes. And that brings us to the redefinition of religion. First, what you just described is also described in the Bhagavat Purana, also known as the Srimad Bhagavatam, as the first stage of God realization, the ability to connect the natural world to the source of the natural world, to see the uh, material world as a transformation of spiritual energy. And we also find in the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna goes through a whole laundry list of the uh, biggest and best and greatest aspects of the material world and says, that's me, you know, of rivers, I'm the Ganges, of mountains, I'm Everest, of, uh, you know, this example or that example, whatever is the best thing in any given category. Um, of seasons, I am the flower-bearing spring. Of secrets, I am silence. Of purifiers, I am the wind, etc. So these are all ways that we can connect uh, the elements of nature to the presence of universal consciousness and the person who is the energetic source of the spiritual energy that gets transformed into the material world. So, religion. But yeah, now... The I mean, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only reacting because you said the person who is the energetic source. So everybody's right. cool with the energetic source. It's whether or Until not it's a it's person, person who is the energetic source. Right. So, you know, there's a, there are a lot of reasons why we do a lot of evasive maneuvers when we hit the theological part of yoga. Um, we have our uncertainties about it. Who knows what kind of religious trauma the people in our teacher We don't want to be cult leaders. Through. We don't want to be cult don't, leaders. Exa- yeah, no cult leadership. And it seems so specific when you say, oh, well, uh, God is a person. Well, that means that there's one person who's God and nobody else is God. And it, so it seems limiting. You know, it seems like that can't be right. Um, and yet it doesn't make any sense to say, well, everyone is God. Because if we were all God, we wouldn't be having all these problems that we've got. I mean, let's face it. If would we, we have more powerful, say? If we were God, couldn't we have more say in what's going on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, and we don't, obviously. Uh, and it, be, you know, it, it's it's a article of faith in mental health that 
feeling you have some level of control over your life is essential. And yet, if you make the list of things we control and the things we don't control, the second list is a lot longer. And, and coming to terms with that is one of the reasons why people who distance themselves from religion think that people invent religion. So let's get back to our definition of religion. We usually think of it as meaning a religion or organized religion or something like that. Which we, one? Which religion do you? Yeah, which religion are you talking about? Yeah. So here's how I deal with that. I go back to the Latin re ligio so re again repeat uh, ligio like a ligature or a ligament that which connects that which binds back uh specifically uh, if you break a bone in your arm you need to reconnect the bone to where it was before so when you bind something that has broken away back then it heals so religion means the healing of the soul by reconnecting to the source of the soul. Mm. If we think of religion that way, now we don't have to be bothered with which particular form of faith inspires us towards that kind of religious experience. The purpose of religion is to uh, create a situation for ourselves and internal existential condition of religious experience of feeling connected to the source of our being and of course religions get co-opted into all kinds of power trips and uh, the message gets distorted in all kinds of ways and then you get uh you know the westboro baptist church standing on the corner saying uh Terrible things happen because God hates gays or some other such. Malarkey. Sometimes people create like they become gatekeepers to the healing of the soul or whatever, like rather than you just reconnecting through an internal innate something, mm -hmm. you have to get through them to get to your healing of your soul. And a lot of times they're not interested in healing your soul at all. They're not capable of it. No, they don't. They, they, they aren't able to do it. They have an ulterior motive. And then you get this distrust of those uh, gatekeepers. And then if someone comes along who actually has spiritual knowledge and can help you, there's a, it, the default is not to trust them. Hence, or if uh, you have religious experience, you don't have anybody you could talk to about it. <laughs> which is actually one of the reasons why I have the webpage that you read from yeah. uh, to offer spiritual companionship and uh, mentorship for people who are on a spiritual journey uh, and who are uh, having either uh, religious experiences or, or glimmers of hope that a religious experience is possible, you know, but it's like, which way down the yellow brick road should I go exactly? You know, and uh, doing a little bit better than the scarecrow, uh, you know, some people go that way, some people go that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, fig helping someone figure out, well, what's the form that your faith should take in order to get you to where you want to go. That's that the science of self-realization is the art of learning how to dance with God. That's what that's all about. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something that my spiritual teachers encouraged me to do as part of my own spiritual practice. And that's uh, if I have any qualification for taking it up, it's because somebody who knows more than me and probably knows me better than I know myself told me that it would be good for me. I could be of service to others and therefore I should figure out how to do it. Well, as a little bit of a side note, I guess I'm curious because that idea that as individuals, we can kind of carve out a conception of God and religion for ourselves that feels right to us. Mm -hmm. That. I've always associated that with this very like tantric idea that you're not, or like tantra small t, not tantra. You have to have a guru to get it, but like right. the idea that it, it's a, a a methodless method that you develop or something, as Jay Krishnamurti would say, or something that it's that there's something tantric about that. Mm -hmm. But your teachers don't aren't necessarily tan, tantra teachers. No, they're but, not. 
Um, so this gets into, so now we pivot from the uh, theological aspect of yoga to the scientific aspect of yoga. What is yoga epistemology? How do we make a distinction between our invented personal truth and a personal realization of an absolute truth? And this gets very not postmodern. <laughs> you know, the whole idea of uh, absolute subjectivity in postmodernism is definitely not something that uh, goes uh, hand in hand with the yoga tradition. That's an important all. point because I think that's something that I've come up against in a certain way. Like yoga seems to exist in a certain context that doesn't start from this premise of like this idea of absolute objectivity or objective metrics or scientific lenses as the truth or something. So well, sometimes it has, there, yeah, it, go ahead. It, it has a scientific aspect to it in terms of how do you uh, analyze and uh, come to a conclusion that you can have reasonable faith in, not just heartfelt faith, not just speculative faith, but faith based on reason. And we hear this uh, in the Yoga Sutras as well as other yoga wisdom texts. Um, and when I teach yogic epistemology, I speak about it in uh, three major categories that break down into some subcategories. So um, the first category is testimony, authoritative testimony, expert witness. Um, and that breaks down into three parts. Uh, one is a teacher. Uh, even Gurdjieff said that, you know, you, you have to accept that if you want knowledge, you got to go to somebody who's got it. Um, you can't just speculate yourself or, or make stuff up, you know? So you go to some, if you want to learn something, like if you want to learn, uh, uh, brain surgery, you go to a brain surgeon, <laughs> you don't just guess like, Hmm, I wonder how it's done or, you know, what would be the best way to do that? You go to somebody who knows. And they yeah, tell but listening you, to your own inner voice and doing brain surgery are not quite the same thing, but your point's well made still. <laughs> but, but we'll get to the inner voice in a minute yeah. because that also has to be there. Uh, otherwise, once again, you have incompleteness. Um, so the first thing is, what have I heard from someone who appears to possess knowledge, and how do I know that they can be trusted? That's actually Arjuna's first question in the Bhagavad Gita. How do I recognize someone who is in this state of being that you have described to me? And then Krishna finishes up most of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita by describing, here are the characteristics of someone who is in a position of transcendental awareness and is therefore qualified to present you with transcendental knowledge, which he uh, speaks about um, how you approach such a person in the third chapter. So let's just say, for the sake of our discussion, that someone appears to be qualified to be a dispenser of transcendental knowledge, and now they've told me something. Well, I'm not just going to take their word for it. I want to know that it has some basis uh, in established knowledge, otherwise known as yoga wisdom texts or spiritual wisdom texts. So you go and you look at a wisdom text in the tradition from which this teacher is coming. Is uh, Does the scripture, does the wisdom text say the same thing that the teacher just said? If no there's a problem. And now you got to figure out like, why is there a disconnect? If yes, that's a first step of verification. Then are there uh, practitioners of the past, historical practitioners, sages who have lived according to this teaching and can verify that by their own personal example, it works. It, it, it actually holds water. If no, there's a problem. You've got to now investigate further. If yes, well, that's a third step of verification of what Patanjali would call testimony or usually verbal testimony because we're talking about an oral tradition. Then the second is logic. Does it make sense? And I usually break that down into two parts. Is it sound and is it complete? By soundness, what I mean is are there any internal contradictions? If yes, there's a problem. If no, 
we're good. It should not have, it shouldn't be chasing its tail. You should be able to logically see that it works. No logical fallacies um, and, and no internal contradictions. Then completeness. Is it applicable in all relevant circumstances? Is everything taken into account uh, that you have to take into account in this particular issue? If yes, we're good to go. It passes the test of logic. And then finally, it has to conform to your lived experience. And this is where the inner voice shows up. You've got an authoritative source of knowledge verified three ways. You've got something that you've analyzed, and therefore you know it makes sense. Now, when you do it, when you act on this instruction, do you get the result that this instruction is predicting? Is there pudding? Is there pudding? Is there proof yeah, in the pudding? Yeah. Exactly. So you've got a theory... <laughs> And the theory looks good, but now you have to do the experiment. And the thing with yoga is the experiment is subjective. You have to do the experiment on yourself. And then you see, am I having a religious experience by doing this thing? Uh, if yes, that's the final thing. That's the final stage of verifying that you've got something that is true and not just somebody's opinion or something that somebody just made up. Wow. I mean, I love that. I mean, I think that certainly like these um, testimony, logic, and completeness, those are certainly kind of lenses or rubrics I've been using myself to try to like be, I don't, I want to be legit. I don't want to be blowing smoke up anybody's ass. And it's really more for me, more than what anybody else is getting from these conversations I'm having. It's more just for myself. I'm very skeptical. You know, I came to yoga, I've been saying this a lot as like a rejection of the Judeo-Christian religions of my parents. And just, I think, and maybe it, it does go to some of what is taught in yoga that as the latter stages of my life are happening, things are coming into my inquiry and into my practice that I think were always there. They just were very not spoken about. I didn't have good words to hold them or something. I think I've always held a belief. Mm-hmm but it's been coming out more. And I guess it does bring me back to this question of transcendent and imminent that we were at before I yeah. took us on a little bit of a epistemological tangent. <laughs> right. uh, but I'm very curious specifically because the other words that we're using, we're always trying to find some words that seem to be able to hold these ideas for us. Uh, but spirit and soul are both, words that we've been reckoning with. And so you wrote this piece about the phrase spirit soul. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious, that does seem to relate to this idea of imminent transcendent, at least I would think. So I don't know, maybe you could speak to either or both. Well, the phrase spirit soul is kind of a qualifier. We are souls in material bodies, and a lot of times we tend to think in terms of identifying with our psychology and thinking that that's me and beyond this me that I identify as this combination of my mind and body, there's a soul back there somewhere. Uh, and I have one of those. Uh, and the idea of spirit soul kind of turns it around to instead of, you know, being someone who has a soul, being someone who is a soul, who's having a human experience that involves having a physical body, a metaphysical body, uh, and the combination of these two things determine what our sense of identity is. Uh, and this gets to the uh, five obstacles of yoga in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, ignorance, forgetfulness that we're the soul and not this mind-body complex. Egoism, the sense of identity that comes from uh, this attachment to the mind-body complex, which is defined by attachments and aversions. And because we think what happens to this body happens to us, and we see when other people die, it appears as if they have ceased to exist, we cling to life or we have a fear of death. So those are our five obstacles. The spirit soul 
is a way of qualifying the conscious person who experiences all of the changes of the mind and the body throughout the course of a life as being categorically different from matter. Uh, spirit is the opposite of matter. Matter is temporary. Spirit is eternal. Uh, matter comes into being at, at a point in time, stays for some time, goes out of being. Spirit does not. And that is one of the overlooked and completely revolutionary ideas that we find in the Bhagavad Gita that we don't find elsewhere. The idea that we are not created beings, that we never come into being at a point in time. You know, in a modern conception of the world, uh, everything comes into being at a, at a point in time. And we see the world through a very historical lens. We explain everything through looking at its history and its historical development. Um, and in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we also come into being at a point in time. God creates us at the time that our body is created. And if we go to heaven or hell after this life, then it's forevermore. But that's not eternal, because to be eternal means to never have not existed. And the first teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is this 12th verse of the second chapter, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future. Is there any possibility that any of us shall ever cease to be? And this is a very radical proposition. And it's one of the reasons why it's challenging for sincere and serious uh, yoga practitioners to wrap their heads around the Bhagavad Gita because its baseline philosophical proposition takes us out of the model that we have received either from traditional religion or modernism. I think you're right there. I think that is the like people who I've been talking to who've been at it for a long time and are just really delving honestly into, I think, the questions that yoga brings about have come up against exactly what you just said, myself included. And I think that you wrote something that I wrote down here that goes to it, and maybe you can speak more when you're talking about spirit and the idea, like you were just saying, of us being like a, the idea of, you wrote Brahman as an undifferentiated unity, mm -hmm. and yet we also experience our, ourselves as individuals. We have individuality. So how both of those things, because that's kind of what I was coming to with some of the folks when we had these questions around higher power, because I was saying, can it be both? Can it also be a universal force that's running through everything that's the source of all life and a personal being who can I re can receive guidance? Can't both of those things be true? And I yes. think that's what you're saying, right? There is a lot of both and in yoga theology as opposed to either or. Our default, we tend to gravitate towards it must be either this or that. Um, if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.